In Europe today, a quarter of a million people die every year from COPD. On a global scale, it's more than 10 times that. Over the last decades, COPD has been the only disease where the mortality has increased constantly. If we don't do anything now, that will continue and COPD will be seen as doom and gloom and not a disease where we can actually impact, prevent and treat. To get COPD, you need to be susceptible and you need to inhale something because COPD comes from the reaction to particles and gases you inhale into your airways and your lungs. So there needs to be an exposure and very often it's tobacco smoke, but it could be indoor pollution, it could be outdoor pollution or occupational exposures. What we know is that particularly tobacco smoke can cause irritation and inflammation and when that inflammation becomes chronic, you get more narrow airways and you get destruction of your lung tissue, you get emphysema. I think our challenge is that the future burden of COPD will look very different from the one we have today, both in Europe but indeed also globally. I think first of all we'll see increases and we'll see decreases. We see less COPD in large parts of Europe today because of less smoking, but the population ages and with aging and sort of surviving your heart disease and whatever else there is, you get COPD and that becomes a burden in the elderly. Within Europe itself, the major change has been a reduction in smoking in older men uh, and in men in general. In women, the smoking epidemic really doesn't seem yet to have reached its peak. It would be optimistic to think that the problem for women is going to be resolved anytime soon. Apart from smoking, I think some of the most important things happen so early in life that you cannot do anything about it yourself. It has to do with how what your mother did when you were actually in her womb. It has to do about birth weight, exposures in very early childhood, whether your parents smoked, whether you had allergic diseases in childhood, whether you had many infections, we know that if we look at 30 to 35 year olds people in Europe, approximately half of their COPD is caused by smoking and half of it at least is caused by these early events. In the rest of the world we find that deaths from COPD and also the prevalence of some forms of chronic lung disease are very much higher as the population becomes poorer. So the real high rates of mortality from COPD occur in South Asia, Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Basically COPD is the main driver of social inequality in health. It's not because you get COPD from being poor, but if you grow up with, in an environment where there's not much money, not much education, poor food, your parents may smoke, you have more infections, you get smaller lungs. And with a little bit of insult from smoking or pollution on top of that, suddenly you have severe COPD. Direct costs associated with COPD have recently been estimated to be about 23 billion euros in the European Union. And these direct costs include the cost of diagnosis and treatment in primary care, in hospital care, medications for example. But indirect costs are also very important. And by indirect costs we mean the costs associated with productivity losses due to absence from work but also productivity losses because patients are less productive because they have COPD while they are at work, and also productivity losses due to early retirement from work. The costs are highly associated with the severity of the disease. A Swedish study has shown, for example, that when a patient has severe COPD, its annual costs are almost 10 times the cost of a patient that has mild COPD and two times the cost of a patient that has moderate COPD. If a patient has very severe COPD, its annual costs are even 30 times higher than a patient with mild COPD and five times higher than a patient with moderate COPD. I think more importantly, COPD is a huge burden to the patients who actually have the disease. 
Uh, very often families and friends do not know what it is. And very often these patients cannot do simple tasks. They cannot shop for themselves. They cannot walk up two flights of stairs. They cannot play with their grandchildren. It's a huge restriction in their life to have COPD. And we know that even very early COPD results in a decrease in your physical activity. So suddenly, even though you only have mild COPD, you're at risk of getting more cardiovascular disease, more osteoporosis, weaker muscles, all these complications that we call comorbidities of COPD. Prevention is key in COPD, and we are talking both primary and secondary prevention. So primary prevention is making sure that the young people do not start smoking. And if we look at it today, unfortunately, it's those at high risk of having poor lung function to begin with, those with low socioeconomic status, who are most likely to start smoking today. And that's really a disaster. So primary prevention is important. But of course also making the diagnosis and then prevent it from getting worse is equally important. I think access to care is key. I think first of all, just access to diagnosis is actually already a problem because there are not enough doctors doing spirometry. But if we say that you have diagnosed COPD, then access to care is not a given thing. First of all, you need to be sure that your GP or the doctor taking care of you knows enough about COPD, and it has been a somewhat neglected disease. The next thing is that the medications, even though they are not extremely costly, Given the size of the disease, the size of the problem, there are huge costs associated with having a care program for COPD regarding medication. For the management of COPD so far, uh, drugs have been considered as the only treatment, and, and that's okay. Drugs work for what they have to work, but the evidence has increased, so it should be translated into the healthcare that other interventions may result in a good prognosis of the disease. And these other strategies that are not pharmacological include pulmonary rehabilitation when the patient requires it, or education strategies for self-management, or lifestyle interventions to improve physical activity or change diet if it's needed. We and other groups have found that the regular practice of physical activity improves the prognosis of COPD patients by reducing the risk of exacerbations, the risk of subsequent hospital admissions, and reducing the risk of mortality for all causes and even for respiratory diseases. And we and others have also found some effects of a specific dietary components that can improve the prognosis of the disease. So these lifestyle interventions, they are effective, they are available, and, and they are cheap. Yeah, there has uh, been a recent Cochrane review by uh, Kreuz et al., who demonstrated that these integrated care programs for COPD were able to reduce the number of patients that uh, required hospital admission, and also the number of hospitalization days were uh, reduced. There's a second study, which is a meta-analysis of health economics studies, which uh, demonstrated that integrated care programs for COPD could reduce uh, the cost of hospital admissions by around uh, 1,000 euros uh, per patient per year. Pulmonary rehabilitation programs so far have not proven successful in changing the behavior of the patient. This is that after the training sessions, the patient does not engage in more physical activity. So the interventions to increase physical activity should not be taken as an alternative, but as a complement to rehabilitation programs and to other treatments, and maybe should start before because usually the rehabilitation is provided when the disease is quite advanced and then there is not so room for improvement. We know that even in well-functioning systems, they do not get offered flu vaccination regularly. There's no follow-up on their medication. Are they still adherent or have they thrown the inhalers away? There's not regular pulmonary rehabilitation, even if they have been on rehabilitation. When they require it a year or two later, they cannot get it again. So I think there are a number of individual points you can find where you could easily make a difference. Cigarette sales are about the same as they were 25 years ago. Uh, they are not going down. They're simply being displaced into places which really cannot afford to have a, a smoking epidemic for all sorts of other reasons as well, but in particular because these are the places that have poor lung function already 
uh, and where there will be a catastrophic effect of smoking if it ever takes hold as it has done in Europe and North America. I think that management will be even more difficult in the future than it is now, particularly because we'll see more COPD in poor regions of the world. There's the cost of medication, but there's also all the costs associated with having a system to manage chronic diseases. So making sure there's regular flu vac vaccination, there's an offer of rehabilitation, follow up on comorbidities, all this requires a setup that is rarely available to COPD patients, not even in well-off countries today. We know that we've got an ageing population and that's not going to change. We know that chronic obstructive lung disease is predominantly a disease of the elderly. And unless we get on top of those uh, issues, that is going to be an increasingly big problem for the health service and for society and for people. So a programme on healthy ageing uh, and working out the best way of delivering that and the most effective package to deliver um, is a very important uh, future programme. I would like the different levels of healthcare talk each other more, let's say primary and specialist care, and I would like to see the relation patient-doctor changing towards a more active role of the patient. I mean, I'm a doctor, I'm a clinician, and I'm also an epidemiologist. So of course, it's interesting and important to look at the big numbers. But to me, it's just as important that in the future, actually, I would like not to sit in front of quite so many COPD patients who've been diagnosed too late, who've not had proper management, and who have difficulty in getting access to care. So for that reason alone, I would personally very much like to see the burden of COD reduced in the future.